I realize before I begin that I'm going to date myself by telling this story. But I was in law school in 1990 when a man named Iben Browning predicted that an earthquake was going to hit Memphis on December 3rd of that year. It was particularly distressing to me because that was right before exams. <laughs> and I was not looking for any disruption in my existence when exams were going to be breathing down on me. But it was a time of learning, I know for me, and I think for some other people in the Memphis area, I didn't know anything about the New Madrid Fault. I'd been here since college, I didn't know anything about the New Madrid Fault. Didn't know we were sitting on one, didn't know one existed. And so to suddenly be learning, oh my goodness, there could really be an earthquake here. This guy may not be right about the date, but there really could be an earthquake here. It was a little startling for me. It was startling for me to realize that the most powerful earthquakes that had hit North America had happened on the New Madrid Fault and that I had been blissfully oblivious up until then, but I couldn't be blissfully oblivious anymore. Now, the naysayers all heard Ivan Browning and said, oh, what's this guy talking about? And they just kind of went on peacefully and paid no attention. But for some of us, it was a reminder that we needed to be prepared for emergencies, even if it wasn't this earthquake. Like, I didn't have a first aid kit put together. And I thought, hmm, I might need to have a first aid kit. I might need to go and get a few things and put them in a first aid kit and know where that first aid, first aid kit is. And I might want to think about having some bottled water on hand. And I, I might want to think about where the flashlights are and where the batteries are for the flashlights. Because anything could happen even if it's not this earthquake. I couldn't unsee and unknow the fact that I really hadn't been prepared for a disaster to happen. Now, of course, December 3rd came and nothing happened. There was no tremor, there was nothing. The naysayers all went home and said, yeah, see, we told you. And me, I thought, yeah, I probably need to hang on to that first aid kit. Now, now that I've taken the time to put it together, I need to hang on to that and I need to know where it is in the house. But there really couldn't be, for some of us, going back to the way things were. Because now that we knew that we lived on a fault, and now that we knew that we needed to be prepared for emergencies, we thought differently. We thought differently than we had thought before. when we encounter the text that we find from Luke's gospel this morning, we hear Jesus giving the same kind of ominous warning. The temple isn't going to exist. It's going to be thrown down. There will be uprisings and wars and earthquakes and disasters. All of these things are going to happen, and we try to hear this with the mindset of this Jewish people of the first century, to think, what are they thinking right now? Because in their holy scrolls that they see in the synagogue and in the temple, they know the story of the destruction of the first temple. They know that story. And if they don't even pay attention in synagogue, they know that story because it's been passed down through generation after generation after generation in their own families. What it meant to be exiled, what it meant to lose everything they knew, and to come back to this land to rebuild now an even grander and more opulent and more incredible temple than they'd had in the first place. So for Jesus to say to them that all of this is coming back again had to be incredibly hard to hear. Been there, done that 
Jesus. And oh, by the way, when did you say that was going to happen? Because we might want to distance ourselves from you. If you're coming and telling us that all of this disaster is going to come, we're not sure that we want to be hanging around where disaster can be because we've heard too much about it. We know too well what disaster sounds like. And yet, these words of reassurance at the end of all this, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, not because disaster won't happen, but because you have committed your life to me. You will be fine. And we are left with this sense of dread, yet hope. How do we hold on to the hope when the dread is standing in the way? And how do we tell ourselves something really important about all of this, that the disaster might have to happen? Because all of those things that we have decided are important and integral to our lives, those might be the very things that we need to cast aside. We can build an opulent temple to God. We can build the most incredible temple to God. But if that temple is not formed on the foundation of our own loving hearts, and our own willing spirits, and our own loving hands, then it's cracked to start with, and whatever we build on it is going to fall on its own weight anyway. So there's a lot of commentary for us about just what kinds of things are going to have to be dismantled in our own lives in order for God's kingdom to come. Because the temples that we've built in our own lives that are temples to injustice and oppression, to selfishness and greed, to bigotry, to holding down others of God's people. All of those temples, all of those structures, all of those things are going to have to be cast down. They're going to have to be dismantled for the peace and the love and the mercy that is God to be able to erect our walls and to show us the way in which we must go. It may be easy for us to say we can follow Jesus when we aren't thinking that we will be persecuted, when we're not thinking that harm could potentially come to us for being Jesus' followers. And it may be a lot harder for us to envision what it means to sacrifice, what it means to be part of that sure foundation of the temple of God's kingdom. And yet that is what we are called to do and be every day. We are called to do what God would have us do. We are called to live into the mission that Jesus himself exemplified for us on this earth. And when our own hearts are broken open and we see ourselves being vessels, vessels that bring in the goodness and grace of God, to everyone who needs to see it. 
then we are part of the coming of the kingdom. We are part of the grace that is the coming of the kingdom. We hold one another in love and we create the foundation for the temple that is God's. And now that we have heard the warning from Jesus, it's kind of like hearing that warning from Ivan Browning. We can't really unhear that. Because now we know the preparations that we need to make. We know the ways that we need to reform our own hearts. We know the ways that we are called to live. And we prepare. And we work to make God's kingdom of justice and righteousness come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.